I'll, uh, I'll be surprised if it takes a long time for you guys to figure out what is unique about our panel. But uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me up on stage. It is incredible to look at the number of people in this room. Uh, Singapore, you look great. Um, uh, and, and I've been really impressed by some of the presentations that we've heard this morning. Um, appreciate all of you have just had a big lunch. How was lunch? Yeah, it was good. Excellent. This is a notoriously difficult time of day, I have to tell you, to do a session. Straight after lunch, you're all thinking about, we just ate, focusing energy to digest, uh, thinking a bit about, should have had that cake. I wish I'd talked to that person. But I promise not to disappoint you. We have an absolutely phenomenal group of panelists coming up on stage uh, shortly. And before I introduce them, I just wanted to take a little time to, to put some context around what we'll be talking about. Um, so this, se this session is really around building a self-sustaining talent engine. Wow. When I read that title, I was like, okay, let's break that down. What do we mean by that? We've heard a lot this morning about the evolution that talent is going through the changes that we're facing in, in the industry. Um, and at the risk of reiterating a lot of what we've already heard, let's just take a second to think about some of the, the challenges that we're facing. Number one, there is more competition for less available skilled talent than ever before. Our candidates and our employees have more access to more information, more technology, and more insight than they have ever. And also, if you think about the type of mobility and convergence that we're seeing, not just in people changing industries, changing geographies, but changing uh, their function as well. And that creates challenges. That's challenging, right? That's difficult for our organization. That's difficult for, for you as our clients as well. Um, but what that means is that as HR practitioners, uh, we're constantly seeking to evolve. We're constantly seeking to change and adapt the way that we're effectively attracting, engaging, developing, and ultimately retaining the best talent in the market. So this session, we're really going to focus on some of the efforts that different types of businesses, we have big, small, local, global, to give you a bit of a range of what they've done to ensure that we're continuously engaging with the best talent in the market. So what I'd like to do is welcome our panelists up to stage now uh, and come and join me up here. Please. Someone said to me just before we came up on stage that it's a particularly attractive panel. Any other comments on uh, what we've got going on here? All the ladies. That's right. Um, so what I'd like, love the, uh, the, the panelists to share a little bit before they go into their presentation, so we're going to have a presentation from each of them, is maybe to give you guys a little of insight into who they are as people. Crazy, I know. Uh, so what I've asked them to do is something that we do with all our new hires at LinkedIn and just ask them to share one thing that is not on their LinkedIn profile. So you can check out all the other stuff that's there. Uh, Dawn. Yes. Hi. Um, can you hear me clearly? Okay. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Dawn Wong. Uh, I'm from Rakuten, Asia. Uh, well, a bit about myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Two fans in the audience. <laughs> Well, a little bit about myself. Um, I have uh, about over 10 years of working experience with Japanese business uh, companies, so ranging from industries such as manufacturing, uh, consumer electronics, and retail, and also my latest venture, which, uh, which is with IT uh, in Rakuten. So uh, perhaps a little bit about myself, which is not actually in the LinkedIn profile. Um, I'm a working mother of a five-year-old boy uh, who at times act like a 20-year-old. Um, and happily married to a loving husband as well, who interestingly acts like a five-year-old sometimes too. <laughs> so um, I think that's probably let you have a glimpse of how I love my challenges and be at home and also at the office as well. So that's a little bit about myself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Madhu Shravastav. I head talent acquisition for Can India, which is an oil and gas company in India. I have roughly around 50, 15 years of experience. So started my career with sales and marketing and then moved on to recruitments, which is all about you know, marketing and sales again. And then one thing which is not there on my LinkedIn profile is I, I am a budding photographer. I've just, start, I've just picked up photography. And when I'm not hiring people, I'm shooting them. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Teresa Pua. Um, basically, I hold three portfolio. I'm actually the group uh, acquisition, uh, talent acquisition head. I'm the uh, group business HR partner for Consumer Banking Group, and I'm the Singapore HR head for DBS Bank. Um, she has three heads. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, what's not on my LinkedIn profile is I, I love to eat, actually, um, although it doesn't really show on me. Um, but, yeah, I love to eat. And, and you know, I, on weekends, I, I'll go for those, uh, you know, like, um, you know, the uh, Mao Shang Wang durian and, and all those, um, you know, um, high-calorie stuff on weekends. Yeah. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Rawlings, and I'm the regional TA leader, Asia Pack for Mercer. Um, I have, as you've seen on my bio, over 25 years' experience, which I don't think I should have put up because that's a lot of years, but anyway. And I have worked on the agency side, and I have also worked in in-house recruitment. I've been with Mercer for, for three years, just under three years, and we've been through a, a great journey that I'll be sharing with you. So one thing that's not on my LinkedIn profile, um, God, I've got a lot of things, but one thing that might interest you is that I am a trained masseuse and aromatherapist and funnily enough that skill has uh, been asked to come into a play in several work environments where I've had exceptionally stressed out bosses that have demanded my attention in their office now and I've turned up in the office and they said neck and shoulders now <laughs> so maybe I should put that on my LinkedIn profile that sounds uh, that sounds great actually maybe you can come <laughs> over to LinkedIn. thank our panelists so uh, you've all got some amazing stories, and I think having worked with these ladies, it's been fascinating to hear their diverse perspectives, and uh, I'd like to share that with all of you as well. So Dawn, perhaps you can share a little bit of insight into Rakuten and some of the efforts you've been driving lately. Sure, definitely. Um, Thank you. Okay, um, well, let me start off a little bit about Rakuten. Um, we are Japan's leading internet service company that started back in 1997. Uh, we empower businesses to, uh, to actually open up their own online shops and also introduce to consumers the joy of internet shopping by providing a platform for them to interact just as how they would do in the real world marketplace. We also provide other online services such as travel, banking, insurance, credit cards, and also such as like Kobo eBooks, Viki Global Video on, um, on Demand, and also our latest acquisition, which is the Viber Instant Messaging. So we are actually voted as one of the most innovative company in the world um, by Forbes last year. And also interestingly, we are also um, the first Japanese company in the world to change our official language from Japanese to English to realize our goal in globalization. So with this backdrop, um, Acquiring top talents in our company has become the most important agenda in our HR activities. So um, how do I actually do it? Maybe I can just start off with a little bit about um, how it all begins. Um, today I'm here. I'm hoping to actually share with you some of my experience using the LinkedIn tool itself, um, especially probably relate to companies that have a very lean HR team as well. So a little bit about Rakuten Asia, where I work. Uh, it's based in Singapore. Uh, it started back in the second half of 2012. So we have grown to a company of over about 100 employees. And I'm actually very honored to be the first HR manager that's hired by them um, back five months ago. So um, I have a very, very robust um, HR team, very efficient, because it consists of me, myself, and I. <laughs> so basically handling a full spectrum of the HR activities in a company. Um, I'm also the first time user of LinkedIn Recruiter Tool. Started back in uh, probably about end of May this year. So, um, and I use that to actually handle my recruitment activities because in the past I did not use LinkedIn. I, I wasn't so sure about what LinkedIn is as well. So I used to deal with recruitment agencies and um, also like job bots. So before I joined Rakuten, um, our main uh, recruiting channels actually involve like recruitment agencies, uh, a whole big part of it company website, employees referrals, and also, of course, recruitment portals as well. So after I've joined them, uh, we were looking into the direct sourcing. Uh, so the interesting part is that uh, with close to 70% of recruitment agencies' um, reliance down to zero, uh, it, it, even my contacts in the recruitment agency say that it's crazy for me to join this company. So um, I think to actually have less than, like from zero to 100 employees in less than two years, 
Um, that really tells you something, as recruitment agencies really, really do love us. So, um, well, but then the good thing is I was able to actually close one of the positions using my existing um, connections on LinkedIn. Uh, so with that, the rest is history. Uh, now, we actually use mainly focus on LinkedIn, a big part of it, uh, company website, and also employees referrals as well. Uh, what I see in that is that I have a very encouraging results. Uh, I'm able to actually see efficiencies in terms of cost and also the qualities of the highest as well. So now putting it into perspective, um, how do I actually incorporate LinkedIn into my direct sourcing activities? So to be very, very honest, uh, I, I believe that you all probably believe in me as well. I truly, truly struggled at the first, first month that I joined in Rough 10 because there was just so much to do, yet there was just so little time to spare. So, however, my turning point actually comes about when I was um, talking to my uh, LinkedIn account manager, Gerald. So, um, during the conversation that I have with him, I, I found myself that I repeatedly telling him, saying that, you know what, I actually do not have time to do this. I do not have time to do that. But eventually, it dawned on to me saying that, like, you know what, actually, I do have time. I wasn't just actually leveraging the tool that I have. So that was a turning point for me. So what I did was I did a drastic change of my whole recruitment, entire um, recruitment activities. So prioritizing and automation became the keywords for me. So in straight three days, what I did was um, I map out the market with whatever I know, which is not that much actually. Um, and what I did is I reached out to potential candidates. Um, I refined all my emails, uh, huge, huge things uh, that was in my portfolio. I was so obsessed into checking out what other homepages are like, the LinkedIn homepage of my subsidiaries, of other companies, because I want to refine the whole entire experience, the whole, um, uh, I want to make this work, basically. So in a week's time, the good thing is, it actually works. So um, I have very encouraging results. I start to actually meet up with a lot, a lot of candidates. Um, gaining a lot of market insight, which is very, very valuable to me. And of course, there are also benefits beyond that as well. Um, I think some of the um, uh, audience here probably will think that, well, yes, there, there's a lot of benefits when it comes in terms of um, recruitment agencies and so forth. I'm not saying that they are not good. They are definitely good as well. But the thing is, however, in Rakuten, we do have a culture that is of a very hands-on approach. So uh, what I did discover is also because of this hands-on approach, I understand the beauty of direct sourcing. Uh, I'm able to actually explain directly to the candidates about the wonderful culture of Rakuten. Um, and at the same time, I'm also able to better manage my own time, especially in high times such as the payroll period. So um, and another thing will be definitely foster closer ties with hiring managers. Um, that's how a business partner should do. So, um, and of course, the last but not the least, to actually connect with global talents around and form very powerful networks is definitely one of the things that I'm able to manage with the LinkedIn tool itself. So, um, when LinkedIn asked me to actually share my stories uh, with the audience, I instantly thought about the, the holistic approach that I have. Uh, well, it's a big term, but um, I think basically it's kind of summarized the experience that I have for the past few months. For me personally, um, LinkedIn Recruiter tool is still a tool, I would say. Um, you will still get your results if you do certain things right. But if you do really want to magnify the results, you have to come up with some proper strategies. So what I've put up here is basically a few things that I will be able to share with you. So first thing will be be personalized. I still kind of DIY all my emails to the candidates just to create that unique connections with them leave an impression with them. Um, next will be to create this win-win situation with both the recruiters and the candidates. So what I do here is that um, be very transparent about in terms of the jobs and uh, in terms of the culture of the company. And then with that, get your expectation across, right? Um, just ensure that both parties have this, they are on the same page. They understand what each other wants. So next will be um, to use your recruitment tool as a talent management tool. Uh, create talent pipelines for definitely positions that you know you need in the futures. But at the same time for me, I have evergreen positions such as sales positions. So what I did is I actually used a job slots to create this position so that I have tangible candidates coming in at every day of the time. 
So moving on will be branding. Of course, this morning you have already heard a lot about the branding part, but I have a personal touch of it. Um, throughout the recruitment activities that I have, um, I met up with a lot of talented individuals. But a lot of them actually told me saying that they have read about a lot of reviews on the internet about Rock 10. Um, so that, that's the thing. We can't avoid it. It's basically, there's just so much information around. Uh, people crave for information. Um, basically, people read reviews. People believe in reviews. I believe most of the audience can actually you know, relate to that. That's why the restaurant reviews is doing really, really well. So, um, so that's the thing. So be able to actually use direct sourcing as a means for me. I'm able to reach out to the candidates, tell them, clarify misconceptions that is actually on the internet. So next uh, will be truly understand the recruitment needs. Sit down your hiring manager, lock them up in the room if you need to. Um, really talk to them, analyze. They, they probably be the best people to actually understand how the market works. Get some information from them so that you can relate to the candidates that you talk to. And last but not the least, um, definitely to never close the connections, especially on LinkedIn, obviously. Um, what I believe is that uh, even though the candidate might not be suitable now, you can say that for the future. And um, of course, they actually will be some important candidates that they can actually refer to, to me as well. I've met up with a lot of people um, during the past few months that I work in Rock 10, and they gave me a lot of insights. They are more than happy to actually share information with me. Um, letting you know about more because they, they kind of want to impress you, but at the same time, we have to do the same as well. So, uh, I mean, meet up with candidates, be personalized, and, and get their connections going. So, um, all in all, uh, with the help of the tool itself, um, I have channeled a, 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 some of the results. Um, basically, the response rate is currently at 50%, which is considered as pretty well. And uh, I was able to actually close nine positions in six week time, both local and global positions. We have closed to about a thousand followers, which by now we have already exceeded as well. And creating a pipeline that recruitment agencies might not even actually interested in at the first place because I can tell the recruitment agencies that, you know what, can you help me check out about this, these kind of candidates? I don't have a placement date. I, I, I don't have a timeline. They probably won't be able to help me with that. And, um, Let's just say, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm being very realistic over here as well. Uh, I'm sure the audience share this same sentiment with me. Um, one of the wonderful things of being a HR personnel is um, there will definitely be surprises waiting for you every day in the office. And that's the whole part of why we actually love being in the HR hot seat. So uh, to be able to actually have a tool like the recruiter tool itself, um, it actually gives me much control in managing my own recruitment portfolio. And at the same time, it does take off some heat of my challenging moments that I experience in work. Um, I have, uh, well, the thing is that that is probably uh, what is in the front, how we actually do things. But at the same time, with the tool itself, I kind of have this, like, this group of HR mini minions working for me at the back end. That actually helped me a lot with it. Because um, at the end of the day, even though when I'm out of the office, I will actually know that when I come back to the office the next day, I know things that, I actually know things that actually is going moving on. Uh, and I hope that my experience actually will be able to actually give you some insights of what I do. And I'm, of course, definitely very happy to actually share more with you off stage as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dawn. And uh, I think it's, we'll deep, in, deep dive into some of your results. I think it's pretty impressive uh, what, what a one-man team has been able to achieve there. Uh, Madhu, uh, if you can maybe share some of your, your learnings in a very competitive industry as Thanks, well. Thanks, Dawn. That was a great story. So, friends, I will now take you through our talent journey at Cairn. And before I move into that, some few facts about Cairn India. So we are among the top 20 global independent oil and gas companies in the globally. We account for 30% of India's crude oil production, so we are into the upstream oil and gas sector. Well, our financials look impressive. In fact, our last year's revenue were a little over $3 billion, US dollars, and our market capitalization is around $12 billion US dollars. In terms of demographics, we have around 1,900 employees, and we started at 1,300 about a year and a half back. So most of these employees have been added in the last one and a half years. We have 10 different nationalities working with us, and, you know, and I agree with Benjamin of Talisman when he said, ours is a truly global talent pool. So it doesn't matter where the people are working, and we really need to reach out to this global talent pool. So 10 different nationalities and 300 plus people have some sort of global experience, which includes Indians as well as you know, the global expats that we've got on board. 
In, in terms of the recognitions, uh, we've, we've been recognized by PLATS, which is a kind of a benchmark and standard in oil and gas. We've, we've been recognized as the fastest growing energy company globally in 2012 and 2012, uh, 13. So a great story. So, so, but what was the problem? So, so when I joined one and a half years back uh, from Citibank, I was like, well, what's the problem? You just need to hire 500, 600 people every year. That's a small number compared to what I was hiring at City and what I was hi hiring at GE. So we were hiring 2,000 plus people. So I said, what's, what's the big deal? But, but there is a problem with the talent. This is a truly niche technical talent pool. There is a real war for talent. And I think Edward from PwC also spoke about it. And, and everybody, all the companies are you know, running after the same talent. And it became even more difficult for us as Ken, given that we were a company which was operating only in India. We do not have assets outside India. And outside India, we've just started recently, you know, some exploration work which is happening in Sri Lanka and South Africa, but that is at very, very initial stages. Hence, the challenge for us was that people outside India were not aware of Ken, were not aware of our growth story, were not aware of our, us being an organization which was growing at a fast pace. So, and, and that's the reason, and that's, that was a real challenge, and the maximum that we'd ever hired in a year was around 200 or 250. So, so 500, 600 numbers was a huge uh, task for us. So what we did, and, and before I go to what we did, you know, some of the t talent challenges, and, and similar to what uh, Talisman spoke about uh, this morning. So globally limited ta technical talent pool, and there is a severe crunch in the experience range of 15 to 25 years. And, and this correlates to the oil prices. There was a dip in the oil prices between 80s and 90s, and that's when, you know, students in colleges stopped taking the petroleum engineering courses, geology courses, and hence the dip. Mix of skill sets is changing from easy oil to difficult oil. So gone is the era of easy oil. So we're getting into difficult, difficult oil. Hence the skill sets like enhanced oil recovery, the skill sets uh, of fracking. So we need to fracture the reservoirs so that they produce more oil. And we're getting into things like water treatment, which is again a niche skill set. So, so oil and gas is about niche skill sets and there is a shortage of the talent pool. And, and like I mentioned, there was low awareness about Cairn. So as it is, there was a small talent pool, and we were not able to get the talent pool. And Cairn was operating at 70% of the budgeted headcount. And, and, and just to give you a little bit of a con context, you know, the most difficult part in an upstream oil and gas company is to get the approvals or licenses from the government to be able to explore. We were in a situation one and a half years back where we had the approval licenses from the government, but we did not have the people or the manpower to be able to execute those licenses, to be able to go out there and explore the, or find the hydrocarbons. So that was the problem. So what we did, so we looked at this problem. So, so we said we need to address the internal problem and we need to address the external problem. In terms, in terms of the internal uh, issues that we had, we, we, we did not have a centralized recruitment team, so we got that recruitment team into place. We, had, we, we got an application tracking system, so basically we got everything that we were doing on recruitment online so that there was transparency in the system which gave a great experience to the hiring manager, visibility to the employees. All our jobs were posted online. We made sure that we reworked on a corporate website. So, so when I looked at the corporate website when I was being hired into the company, I realized there was no information. In, and, and, and I'm sure most of the candidates were facing that problem. Especially the career section did not speak about anything. There were no jobs which were open. So visibility was a real issue. We were not present on LinkedIn. We were not present on. So what we did was we revamped the corporate website made sure the career section gave a lot of information, and all our active jobs were posted on the career section. Uh, the other thing that we looked at is we looked at the source mix. And like Dawn said, you know, traditionally we were a company which was looking at recruitment consultants, but there was a problem there again. We, we had recruitment consultants who were only in India and did not have access to the global talent pool. So the first task was to identify the best recruitment, best-in-class recruitment consultants who were working with the oil majors, with BP, BGs of the world, and get them impaneled. And then as soon as they heard our story, I mean, most of them were willing to work with us. So we got them impaneled. We looked at a, uh, we, we looked at a referral program. And, and this, is, this is such a niche talent pool, and it's well-networked talent pool. So, you know, we, we, we worked on the referral schemes. We had, uh, and, and like somebody in the morning session said, yes, we did pay attractive referrals, but what, what we did was we did floor walks. We spoke to our employees about the open jobs and insured or, or requested them for referral. So that has been a good success or win for us. So once we got our house in order, the next step was to look externally on how we create brand awareness outside uh, India. 
So the first uh, thing that we did was we embarked on our journey on social media. So we got onto Facebook, we got onto Twitter and LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is the biggest one out of all of these. And we use LinkedIn, not just the recruiter licenses or the basic recruiter solutions. So we've got the licenses, we've got the job slots happening for us. We've got dynamic career pages. So, you know, every time, if, if a technical person comes onto our web page, he sees a different content. If there is a student who's coming out of college and seeing our content on the web page, he sees a different uh, content. He or she sees a different content. So that's been a good thing. And, you know, we've been able to create groups. We've been able to uh, engage with them. The second uh, initiative that we've taken, and this is kind of new in the oil and gas, so I'm not too sure how many companies in oil and gas actually do this. So when it comes to the global technical talent pool, there was a limit on the number of expat employees we could hire. So, so we had a good mix of expat employees, 10 different nationalities. However, we still had to go out and hire the Indians and get the nationals back into India. But, but we didn't know where they were. So you know, we, we embarked on this journey of market mapping where we went out to the oil and gas hubs across the globe. And we started with Calgary, which is in Canada, which happens to be the hub of oil and gas. So we went to Canada and we mapped the entire market for all the Indian professionals or people of Indian origin with 10 plus or 15 years of experience. And we got them into, and we got them into you know, different buckets saying these are the petrotech guys, these are the HSE, health safety and environment guys, these are the projects guys, and reviewed their profiles and engaged with them on LinkedIn, created a group there. So once these people were mapped, we followed it up with a networking event or an awareness creation event at Calgary. So this, unlike you know, the recruitment campaigns, we did not go there to hire people for the current roles, but we went there to engage people for the future. So, so we went there, it was an informal networking event, and we got to know the people, followed it up with one-on-one -on -one discussions the next day, and, and created groups on LinkedIn, and even today we continue to engage with those people. And in the last one and a half years, we've been able to hire some of them as well. So this was a great initiative, and in fact, uh, this year, as we speak, we are doing mapping for Houston, we are doing mapping in Middle East and Far East, which are again the oil and gas hubs. The third piece is recruitment campaigns, and obviously we followed it up with both international campaigns as well as national campaigns and have been able to hire a lot of people. And this is something which has worked well for us. In terms of uh, the other piece that we are doing, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of conferences, technical conferences in the oil and gas space, like in any other sector. So we, we identified what are the top technical conferences, uh, you know, where, where, where does the talent go? And these are generally conferences where people do paper presentations, there are poster presentations. So we combined it with a recruitment activity and a branding activity. So we ensured that we had a cane presence there. We were talking to people about our company. And in, in, in fact, uh, one of the conferences which happened in US a couple of months back, we used the LinkedIn check-in uh, uh, facility. So I don't know how many of you are used, have used that, but any, everybody who was walking into the conference was actually checking into, our, uh, checking into uh, LinkedIn and actually creating a database for us. And then we've now converted that into a group and we are continuously engaging with those people. So that's the, so, so now we have a well-doiled recruitment engine with both internal house in order as well as you know, the external initiatives that we've kicked off. So what have we achieved? And the story has been good. Like I said, we were at 1300 headcount about a year and a half back. Today we are at 1900. So most of our business critical positions are filled up. We've, we've got, we are operating at 96% of our budgeted headcount. And actually, when I was in Calgary for the meet and greet event, what I had learned there was most of the companies were operating at 80 to 85% of the budgeted headcounts. So you know, being in a situation where from a 70% we reached to a 96% budgeted headcount is a great story and has been recognized by the leadership team. The technical leadership team is in place. So, so you know, we had a lot of roles where we did not have our you know, the senior most people in place. So in the last one year, one and a half years, we've added 30 odd people and most of them, like, I mean, the, somebody was asking a question, how many of us profile these people on LinkedIn? Yes, we profiled them on LinkedIn, we saw their connections, we really, I mean, has been a great story. And not only the leadership team, even the second line is completely in place. No, LinkedIn, like I said, has been a great story while there is little bit of presence on Twitter and Facebook, but in terms of LinkedIn, and we started using it only about a year back, We've seen a 600% increase in follower base. So we started with 2,000 followers, has gone up to 15,000 followers. And approximately 45 to 50% of those are in the oil and gas sector. So the right kind of followers. In terms of the talent brand index, we've, again, we moved from 3%. Today we are at 14%. And if I look at my closest competitor, the closest competitor will be at around, I think, 34%. So that's where we target to go to in the next three years. And the best, and last not the least, and which was the biggest problem for us, we've been able to create a buzz in the oil and gas market. 
So if, if, if you know, somebody was to ask, uh, uh, somebody was to ask a technical talent pool about a year and a half back, have you heard of Ken? So out of 10 people, maybe not more than two people, including the Indians, would say, no, we've not. I think it's a company in India. But really, people did not know we were an upstream oil and gas production company. We were the fastest growing energy company in the world. But today, seven out of 10 or six out of 10 people say that. So, so that this was the biggest win for us. So there is a good brand recall, and people actually know who we are. And, and that was the biggest challenge. And once people know who we are, people know about a growth story, there's no looking back. We've been able to hire our people. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I think we'll, we'll love to explore a little bit more about how you've uh, gone into that very niche segment. And, and then I think if we um, uh, pivot to you, Teresa, another heavily competitive industry, uh, love to hear a bit more about what DBS is, is doing at the moment. Okay. Um, now, um, DBS basically, um, okay, what, I mean, all of, I mean, this morning we talked about you know, hiring talent, and, and I think we all agree that hiring talent is difficult, right? And, um, you know, gone are the days when, you know, we post an advertisement and we pray that somebody comes along and responds to our advertisement, right? So at, at DBS, we hire 5,000 people every year. So, you know, uh, across our key markets. So how do we get 5,000 people on board every year? And uh, one of the things we did or decided to do was to basically go on a social media uh, uh, journey. So what we did was basically to create a, a strategy, a 3E strategy. Um, at DBS, we love acronyms. So, you know, um, the first E is entrenched. So basically, uh, you know, uh, entrenching social recruitment practices into our HR culture. That's the first E. The second E is engaging. Uh, you know, we talked about um, engaging uh, passive candidates, so that's our second strategy. And the third is really to enhance, you know, enhancing DBS brand as employer choice and to, um, you know, um, enhance our uh, employee value proposition. So um, what do we do for, um, oops, for Entrench? Um, basically, um, we, we believe that all our recruiters are, are DBS ambassadors. So all of us, are, we call ourselves talent hunters. Of course, I'll talk about talent farmers later. But you know, it, first and foremost, we're talent hunters. So what we, what we did really was I got all my recruiters to create LinkedIn profiles. We basically um, updated all our profile. I got all my recruiters to connect with each other. So we, the minute we created profiles, we connected with each other. We connected with fellow DBS employees. We connected with whoever we knew to create the whole network. Because as you know, LinkedIn, getting candidates is about creating the network. And then what we did was also, you know, we decided to all take a photo, our corporate shots. So uh, once we took our corporate shots, we all uh, updated our profile. And, and this is what we all look like, you know. So the, the minute when we, we all uh, updated our profile, it created a buzz. And I had a few people, you know, SMSing me and say, hey, Teresa, you know, what's happening at DBS, you know? So I said, well, you know, uh, we're trying to create a buzz. So that was the idea, right? Because the whole idea is, is um, our, our employees are our ambassadors. So the more we are connected to people out there, the more we get talent coming into DBS. So that's the first E, okay? Um, as you can see, it's very subtle, but the DBS uh, logo is in the background. Okay, the next E, engage. So what do we need to do to engage, right? Just uh, this morning we heard 80% of the candidates are passive, right? So what do you do? If you're going to send an email, it doesn't mean that the person is going to respond to you tomorrow, right? So um, what we basically uh, um, did was to engage potential uh, employees or rather potential uh, candidates. What we did was we just, uh, we sent them in emails and we said, hey, you know, you've got a great profile. And, um, you know, uh, if there's any uh, um jobs that you might be interested in, please reach out to us. So we, keep, we, we kept in contact. So the minute you connect with people, right, that's the first connection that you make. Of course, some people will say, hey, you know, Teresa, I'm not interested, you know, right now, but, you know, uh, uh, I've got somebody that I can uh, recommend. That's great. And that's what we want, right, in terms of the connection. So when we, um, when we do engaging, what we really did was we, we, we went through a marketing campaign. And basically, we, we had a few of these campaigns. We updated our banner. We went to our DBS LinkedIn website, and we updated the content. Um, DBS corporate color is red and black. And as you can see, I'm also in red and black. Um, <laughs> and you can see our, our um, banners are also red and black. But that's the idea, right? Because one of the things that we do, and it's important, this morning we talk about branding, right? When DBS goes out to campus or to any corporate event, we always wear red and black. Right, because it creates it creates the impact uh, when when we do that. Okay, so anyway, we did that. Um, some of you are familiar with job slots. So basically, what we did was when we posted jobs on the job boards, they pulled the jobs over and they uh, put it on on LinkedIn. So that that, that way we get uh, the the jobs flowing into to LinkedIn. 
and of course, one of the things to engage is to create what we call uh, engaging content, right? And maybe that, that brings me to my next uh, uh, E, which is actually enhance. So what we did was we needed to enhance our employer brand, right? And how do we enhance our employer brand is actually through creating content. So what we tried to do was to give all our followers a sense as to basically what it is like, you know, what, 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 what does it, I mean, all right, rather like, you know, what does DBS employees do, right? Uh, how does it feel to be working at DBS? What are our, our employee value proposition? What's our culture? So that's what we did. We created content and basically um, every, every week we probably posted a few postings and we actually sent it out to our followers. So that's how we created the content. And, uh, right, so that's basically the three E's. And uh, the numbers speak for itself. So, you know, we have more than 50,000 uh, followers right now. Uh, we have actually, um, beginning part of this year, we had 20 over 1,000. And in the last seven months, we have actually doubled. We have moved from 25,000 to 50,000 followers. We have posted more than 150 postings uh, this year. And we sent out more than 1,500 emails. And our emails uh, is actually personalized, and it comes from us. It's not those uh, you know, standard e uh, template, and you know, it, it's, it's personalized. It comes from us, right? And we have a um, 30% response rate. Um, for, I understand it's quite a good rate. Of course, it's not as good as 50% here, but 30% uh, is a good rate. <laughs> okay? So um, what I wanted to basically end off with really is a video. Um, early this year, LinkedIn actually approached us, and uh, we, we basically... Uh, work together on the video, and the video basically tells the story of how DBS um, went on our social media journey together with LinkedIn. The numbers are actually uh, slightly outdated because it was done at the beginning of the year, but I think in essence, it puts together the whole story, and basically, you know, that's really what I want to share at DBS. Okay. In Asia, our vision is to be the Asian bank of choice for the new Asia. The core values of the bank drives the way we behave as well as the way we work and do business. We share a strong sense of common purpose. We value relationships. We believe and we embrace innovation. And we are empowered to be decisive uh, in the way we work. Lastly, we possess this excitement of being the future of banking. We are looking for dynamic people, people who are hungry for success, um, people who have a vision to make things happen, and we are looking for the next generation of leaders, people who want to be part of the future of banking. In terms of talent acquisition, um, we are looking into going more digital, and we are strongly going into leveraging on social media as an alternative channel to reach out to potential candidates. In DBS, the traditional sources of recruitment channels that we use would include posting jobs on job boards. But what this has shown us is that there is a potential pool of passive candidates that we are not reaching out to. And therefore, we need to look for an alternative channel where we are able to reach out to this group of passive candidates. Using LinkedIn Talent Solutions allow us to reach out to passive candidates. The email messaging system gives us an opportunity to reach out to these potential candidates and it allows us to establish a relationship with them. And we also want to make a more thorough search for potential candidates. Using LinkedIn Recruiter allows us to do that. We have also managed to achieve cost savings as well as a shorter time to hire. As a result of using LinkedIn Talent Solutions, we have seen our followers increase threefold from 8,000 to more than 24,000. Our work with us impressions have also grown year on year by 26%, and more than 27,000 unique visitors have checked out the profiles of our employees. This is a very healthy sign because it shows that people are keen and have interest to work with DBS. Social media is changing the way we work. And we need to leverage on social media like LinkedIn to continue to attract talent and build our employer brand.
Good afternoon, everybody. You know what they say, you should never get on stage after an animal act in terms of fun. Kids, and now I think it's a great corporate video, but I will try to keep you entertained. Today, I would actually like to share with you the Mercer story about how we've changed our whole talent attraction practice internally. But before I begin, I just want to give you an update on Mercer because a lot of people, when I mention that I work for Mercer, they always say to me, particularly if they're in HR, oh yes, you're the salary survey people. You give me all my benchmarks, <laughs> right? Well, I'm here to tell you we also have a lot of other lines of business which we offer to our clients. And it's all around professional services in terms of HR consulting. So we look after the health, the wealth, and the performance of your most important asset, which are your people, right? So we have a broad spectrum and we don't just do salary surveys. Anyway, Mercer has over 3,000 people within Asia Pac, and we have four lines of business, and we also have an internal TA team of 15 recruiters and recruiting managers located in different hubs according to business needs. We turn over around about 700 roles every year, so we're kept quite busy. So just within that context, I'd like to now share with you just some of the key points in terms of our journey. I've been with Mercer since 2012. I inherited a very traditional recruiting team. The team were exceptionally process-driven and very reactive. I have taken them on a journey into a developmental stage, moving towards what I want, which is a very strategic recruiting space. Strategic in as much that we have the talent at the right time when business needs it, rather than being reactive, which is what I inherited. So you're probably looking at this journey, this transformation, and thinking, yeah, I can kind of identify with what Lisa's saying. I can see myself on that continuum line at the beginning still, halfway through or towards the end. And no matter where you are, I'd like to share some points with you that might help you and, you know, to predominantly get some key takeaways so that you can practice some stuff when you go back to the office. So why did we decide that we had to go on this journey to more strategic hiring linked into our business strategy? We wanted to become more efficient. We simply were taking too long to find people. And when you look at TA, all TA is, is finding the solution to a business need. Finding a solution to a business need. So we wanted to be more efficient at what we did. We also wanted to have great business impact, right person, right time, right place, and hopefully right cost. We also wanted to have some passive ta talent targeting. Mercer is a very difficult company to recruit for because we need expertise in a really niche market. We spoke about oil and gas before being niche. Mercer, we have to find experts in exec rem, not even broad-based compensation, that can consult to guys like you that know their stuff. So it's a very niched marketplace, and we wanted to find passive talent instead of just the 20% that are on the surface that are looking actively for work. We also want to improve the quality of hire. We had no consistency around quality. And on top of that, we wanted to reduce the cost of hire. We've talked about dropping down to zero agency cost. Mercer had a very hefty agency cost, and we wanted to drop that down as far as we could also. And finally, talent pipeline management, the guru. Everyone talks about pipelining, but do we really understand what pipelining is about? Do we? So everyone says, you know, we need to build these pools of talent, we need to have generic skill sets, we need to, you know, match them to our business critical roles, but then what do we do with them? This is the core issue that I think a lot of organizations fail. And I think it comes down to the fact that we don't realize that, I'm going to say a dirty word now, so cover your ears if you don't want to hear it, but it is a sales process. It's purely a sales process. It's working out when someone is at the passivity level, how to move them across into the engagement, and how to make sure at the end that when they're ready to look for work, that they think of your organization first, your top of, top of mind, and they come to you. So that was our goal, 
2014, we are just embarking upon a really exciting project that I'm going to share with you towards the end, which is our pipeline build project. So let me just walk you quickly through, just before I tell you about that, some of the steps that we've taken since 2012. First bit is, I think you would all familiarise yourself with this, get your house in order in terms of standard processes, um, SLAs, make sure that you get the right people on the bus. So I inherited a team of 15. I have changed over 14 of them because this cultural shift that's required to move into pipelining, to move into candidate engagement, involves a different skill set. It involves people that want to speak to other people, not just type. It involves people who see every single talent that walks through the door as an asset that could potentially, maybe not today, but in the future, give you the talent that you're actually looking for. So we developed our process maps and our competency models, and we also did SLAs, we did uh, you know, channel sourcing maps. We actually laid down the foundation, and the most crucial thing for me was to get the right people on the bus that had that consultative customer service focus that wanted to speak and engage with talent and see them as a real asset and not just part of a process to move from one to the next to the next. So we then built on that kind of around 2013 and went, great, we've got these standard practices, we've got great people, now we have to get them to be more efficient and more effective leading towards our strategic goal of pipeline building. So how do we do that? digitalization, that's hard to say actually, we actually ramped up our web pages, we made them look better, we got a dynamic, well we're getting a dynamic careers page with LinkedIn so that we're customising channels for our talent. We also developed an intranet, one-stop shop for all our hiring managers on all the key things that they need to say around EVP and, and how to assess candidates and how to engage with candidates. We also got some cool tools in. We got LinkedIn recruiter licenses for everyone. And that, within a very short space of time, with very intensive training, we've now increased our source of hire in terms of direct hire to 40% of our placements from zero in a year. And don't forget, we have you know, just under 800 placements. So we actually brought in a lot of different service tools to actually help. In, in terms of our efficiency and effectiveness. And I could talk about this for the next 20 hours, but I need to move on. So the final stage is actually in our passive talent type build. And we've actually coined this our early bird project after the saying that the early bird catches the worm. So let me just walk you through some of the key things with our early bird project. Don't forget that this project has just started this year, so we're still learning and there's a lot of challenges that I'll probably speak to you about later. But there's three core elements to our early bird project. The first one is to identify what talent we're actually looking for, and everyone knows and understands that concept. Then moving through to sourcing, where do we find them? And then finally, as I said, that key piece that I think in the whole jigsaw of pipelining is always left out or just left to chance, and that is that engagement piece. So within the identify one, I think everyone knows that you need to define what your business critical roles are and really try and work out in the next three to five year period, what will my talent look like? Because nothing is static. It's a dynamic continuum. So what do I need to actually find for that? Then, competition. How are you going to support growth? What sort of competencies are needed to support growth? And see if you can overlap some of these skill sets. Don't try and compartmentalize talent into, well, that job title and that job title. Think about how you can overlay skill sets so that you can do proper telling, pooling, and take advantage of every talent that comes through your door. Reinvent talent gaps. Make sure if there's any talent gaps that you can pull them through. So identify. Now, in Mercer, we actually have an annual review and we sit the managers down and we say, okay, so who in your internal pipeline could you put into these business critical roles? If they don't have an answer, then we make sure that we look externally and make sure that we have people for the business critical roles. So then we go into sourcing stage two. Now, this is a really cool phase because recruiters love to do this. So obviously, we do advanced Boolean searches. We use LinkedIn. We use our alumni. Passive talent maps. We can go externally and, and use vendors. But one really great thing is we actually sit down with each one of our key business stakeholders 
and, and we say to them, okay, who do you know? It's called a who do you know campaign. And we go through their LinkedIn profiles, we go sometimes through their Facebook profiles as well, look at their membership, and try and really extract the data out of their head because I can tell you that most of the people that are in your company know most of the talent externally. But it's just that linkage, that process of getting it out of their head and in to some sort of format that can be managed. So we actually have a program, and I've got a whole document that I've trained all my recruiters on how to run those meetings and how to get the best out of those meetings. And then the final phase, as I said, is the engagement phase, which is the most important. Now, this particular phase is crucial to have multi-dimensional touch points with candidates in a customized way. So what we're looking at doing at Mercer is to have kind of two major groups of in information going across our passive talent. One is an institutionalized process, because Mercer, I don't know if any of you are on our, any of our LinkedIn groups, we have over 26 of them, um, but we, we have so much content, really interesting content coming out globally. So we actually want to have some sort of mechanism to utilize that across our, our talent bank in an institutionalized way. So at any one point in time, we know that there's always material of interest to our candidates and our pipeline that's coming across their desk. Think about it as a sales process, okay? Think about it to move from a suspect to a prospect to a buyer to a client to an advocate. That's the process that you want your, your candidates to actually move through. So we also, in terms of the second part, we have also developed brand ambassadors that we use internally within the company that are partnering with HR. And I use the word partnering because partnering is crucial for this CRM component. They partner with HR and they're given, for want of a better word, a stable of key candidates that they have to look after and have a personalized approach. Why? Because top talent wants to engage with your top talent, not necessarily HR. They want to feel inspired. They want to feel motivated. They want to look up to someone within your organization and say, hey, I want to work for them. And so that is why we want to use our business leaders as key engagement points for our candidates. So we have actually developed a training program for them. Don't laugh, but you know, some people aren't naturals at networking and engaging with people. So we've, we've developed a training program to actually help with that engagement piece for the managers that actually want it. So as I said, this is a work in progress. Currently we're at the second phase and I'm working very heavily with marketing because I believe that marketing and communications goes hand in hand with TA. In actual fact, you should have a Marcoms person in your TA team. So I just wanted to end with partnership, key points, partnership, build a CRM around your talent pipeline and talk, talk, talk. Use the phone sometimes. All right, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks, ladies, for, for sharing some uh, some fairly diverse perspectives. We've still got a few minutes left to, to ask questions, and if for whatever reason I haven't captured your question, we will be in an adjacent room afterwards, so feel free to come and bug, uh, bug these guys uh, and myself if you'd like. But... Um, got a bit more to share. So uh, Dawn, I think uh, it was really interesting to hear your presentation. And I think there's sometimes a little bit of a misconception out there that to be successful in social recruiting, you need to have a big team and lots of resources. Uh, obviously, that's not the case. Um, so hoping you could share maybe some tips and tricks that, um, that the audience could take away in terms of how you've scaled your efforts um, with respect to sourcing. Okay, sure. Um, all right. So um, I think what I did is um, I kind of segregate my activities I call it the day activities and the night activities. So I have to elaborate a little bit more before it sounds really fishy. So, uh, well, the, the day activities basically is um, I dedicate uh, one whole hour every morning just to do LinkedIn activities, pure recruitment activities. So I lock myself in a room uh, with a phone next to me and with my computer right in front of me. So what I do is basically I will refine my searches. I'll save my searches. Um, I'll go into, for example, um, like a job, uh, my job slots just to see how many applicants actually apply, go through their CVs, and of course, 
um, it's a godsend that, that there is this um, hiring manager tool whereby actually I'm able to forward this out to the hiring managers. Uh, it helps me with a lot of stuff because I don't have to physically print out the CVs or, or, or download the CVs and then forward it out through emails. So that actually scaled back a lot of time. Um, other than that is um, I actually use that hour to, you know, communicate with the candidates as well. Um, you know, sit down with the hiring managers and, and actually talk about some of the keywords that is very important in an industry. It can be keywords that link to, for example, the products, the services, uh, um, the markets. Um, there are all sorts of really interesting keywords which um, probably touch on the engineering terms which I have no idea about as well. So this, this is a place where the hiring managers are able to help me. So that will be the, the day activities that I have. So when it comes to the night activities itself, um, I can take credits for it actually. Um, so because I have already saved search um, that I've done during the day, so what I do is um, um, actually LinkedIn helped me with it. They actually automatically send me feeds of potential candidates that is based on my search. Um, so with that, the next morning when I wake up and I go to work, I'll be able to actually set, have a, a handful of candidates that is already in my account waiting for me to actually view. So uh, with that perspective in mind, it actually cut off a lot of time. Uh, it became really automated as well. Um, as I mentioned to you before, automation is a key word for me because um, I'm a one-man show and I have to do so many things. Um, and other than that is because uh, when you actually view the candidates itself, um, they have this really wonderful um, tool whereby you actually be able to see like similar profiles. So that actually is very helpful in the sense that sometimes they actually deliver better candidates than my search. So um, with that, uh, I'm also able to actually see what other people views, um, maybe similar profiles and so forth. So it's kind of led me to think about like, you know what, actually maybe I'm going into the wrong channels. This probably might not be the keywords that I'm looking for. So with all these similar um, profiles that actually I'm able to see actually helped me a lot. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, all the audience, if you actually get to use it, you kind of like, maybe you'll, you'll kind of like uh, uh, um, have a little bit of difficulties at the beginning stage because you kind of have to set up the, the whole entire deal. Um, but other than that, it actually is a very, very smooth, um, smooth ride um, thereafter. So I think that's probably summarized the whole thing. So automation and prioritization yes. is key. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and I think, uh, obviously, just uh, shifting over to Medu, because you talked a little bit about that as well. And one of the areas that you mentioned that I know would be particularly interesting to people is around market mapping. Um, and in particular, we hear a lot from clients around how to track talent back um, that, that might have moved offshore. So maybe you could just highlight a little bit more about how your team went about that. So, so we went about it uh, in a very structured manner. First of all, we identified the markets where we would find the talent. So we looked at the oil and gas hubs. So we, there, there were a lot of them, and we said, you know, we'll focus on the first top three or four. So we said Calgary in Canada is one big hub. Middle East is another one. Far East is uh, the third one, and the fourth one we, we said was Houston. And, and then we went about uh, the activity of mapping the Indians there. So, you know, LinkedIn uh, played a big role there. So we had the recruiter licenses, so we could, you know, mine the entire database, look at the profiles there. We also looked at the profiles of uh, our technical talent and, and saw their connections. You know, that was a huge, like, like I said, it's, it's a limited uh, talent pool, and, and everybody is so well networked out there. So, you know, what we did was we went into the profiles and saw, saw what their connections was and got, got it out into a list. The third thing that we did was we got these people into, you know, buckets of uh, competence, uh, expertise or skill sets. So we, we had the drilling guys in one bucket, we had the petroleum engineers in one bucket, the projects guys, HSC guys, and we ran those profiles through our hiring managers or our, you know, the leadership team. And we said, who are the people we would want to engage with? And, and we started engaging with these, uh, these people. We created groups with them, formed communities, started communicating. And it, last, not the least, we followed it up with a networking event, like I mentioned earlier as well, so, which was a huge success. So, you know, most companies go out to markets with a, with, a, with a recruitment agenda, saying, I need to close 20 positions, I need to close 30 positions. We said, we don't want to hire anybody yet. We want to create a buzz in the market. We want to tell our story, what we all stand about, and, you know, continuously engage with that talent. So, again, LinkedIn has played a big role, I would say, and then, yes, on Twitter and Facebook as well. So, we've connected with these ta this talent pool. We are continuously engaging with the talent pool. And, and it's been a great story because, you know, I, I don't think many companies have done this, but at least for us, it's worked out very well. And then this has, like, become one of the key initiatives that we are trying to, you know, do it in the other areas as well. 
Yeah, and I think a few people talked about that continuous engagement with passive talent, so it's great to, to re-emphasize right. that. And Teresa, something that you talked about was the, the shift towards more of a p- passive talent. Um, so maybe you can share some ideas or, or what you learned through um, yeah. uh, proactively engaging with that, that demographic. Yeah. I mean, for, for DBS, basically, we, we have evergreen positions, so we know what kind of positions will come up one year down the road. So the intention for, the, for us really is that we connect with, with people in advance. And, and like I mentioned just now, once we connected with them, what we do is we keep them engaged. We, we uh, basically created the content. So we, we sort of um, let them know what's, li- what's life at DBS like. You know, what does a person do? So we, we, we created a video for, for some of the... Because we were trying to reach out to the young ones through, through Facebook. So what we did was we created a day in the life of a management associate, a day in the life of a banker specialist, a day in the life of a relationship manager, so that you know, people say, hey, you know, what's, what's it like to be working in, in a bank? What's, what's an RM do? So when they watch the video, they get a sense of what really the person does. And, and, and through that, we actually connect with them. So like what Madhu said, right, the idea really is not to say, oh, today I engage somebody and therefore I want to hire. It's the, I engage you, I keep you, um, um, you know, uh, I keep you in my network, I cont- continuously engage you as to what DBS is as an employer of choice. Uh, even if today you don't join DBS, you may join us one day. Even if you don't join us today, you may recommend somebody else who you think may be a better fit at DBS. So that's really the intention. So when we look at it, the, the return on investment, so to, so to speak, we don't really look at it as immediate, but we look at it as a future. And as all of you know, when it comes to employer branding, there is no ROI that you can really you know, measure and say, you know, because I've done this, therefore it has led to a certain... Uh, outcome. You know? So in a way, when we look at it, we take a longer term view with regards to what we do in terms of the passive candidates. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And it is like a longer term journey yeah. that you that working through. And and I think Lisa, you also talked about the journey that Mercer has been on. It was quite incredible. You know, the amount of transformation that you've seen. And I guess with any transformation and change comes change pain, right? And we're probably all facing it. So, what were some of the challenges that you were faced with, mm. um, with your team, with your stakeholders, and how did you work through that? Mm. It's a really good question. Um, I think there were three main areas that really caused a lot of pain um, during this transformation phase. First one, which I think a lot of people uh, identify with, is the fact that we had to get buy-in from business. Funnily enough, you know, business is the one that needs the talent, and yet in terms of the partnership approach, it was always the idea that your HR, so you can actually find the talent when I need it. So it was changing that mindset, and we found that the best way of overcoming that was to deal with it um, from the top down, so that the CEO had to live and breathe that everyone is a talent scout, everyone's out there looking in the marketplace, in their networks, and then actually, you know, your JD should have a component that you look at predecessors for you that could come up, sorry, successes for you that could come up, or external talent or internal talent that could fill roles. So... That whole business partnership was actually pretty difficult. Um, in some cases, I did a lot of presentations at regional level, you know, showing them the strategies and the ideas. And it was, all, it was a sale, sales process for me, funnily enough. And in some cases, we did get pushback where business said, oh, but our priority is to actually, you know, hit our sales targets. We can't spend any time on talent development. And yet... Ironically, you can only hit your sales targets unless you have great talent selling, right? So it was like chicken or egg, what comes first? And it's that putting that convincing story together that can really push your, you know, talent pipelining in partnership with business agenda. Second thing, which I'm sure any recruiter sitting in the room will always lament that if they have to pipeline build, what's going to happen to the business as usual, current open roles? So it was finding that happy medium between recruiters going, okay, so I need to fill these 15 to 20 open roles, but at the same time I need to think of the, of the future and start to proactively build talent and engage with them. So some of the things that Mercer has done to try and help with that kind of resourcing situation is to look at any kind of low-value, high-volume um, you know, volume work that could be taken off the recruiters and put into a lower cost centre, perhaps offshore in the Philippines, which is what we've done. And in some cases, we've also offshored some of the work to India. So that's freed up around 30% of the time of my recruiters. And now that 30% is spent on pipeline building, um, you know, and engaging with, with talent. And then the third thing, lastly, is 
just the lament of what tool do you use to ensure that the data you collect around this mapping exercise and, and candidate pipeline build is there so that you can sort on it easily later, you can record all the contacts that have been um, managed with that particular talent. So everyone has a record of how that talent ha has been engaged with. And I'm sure a lot of people in, in the room have got ATS systems that don't really have a functionality or a strong functionality around that. We have Taleo, so you can feel, yeah, feel for me. So, so we're actually looking at you know, other CRM tools to, to bolt on to that ATS system, which has got that next generation you know, Web 2.0 capability of bringing in all the social networking sites, everyone being able to dump information in and update information and extract it easily. So they're the three main pain points. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And I'm sure that a lot of us in the audience could probably share with you on some of those those lessons learned. Um, we are out of time, so please help uh, join me in thanking our wonderful panelists uh, up on stage. And if you do have questions, we'll be next door after. <laughs>